can hear myself in Italian over there. Um, so the important part of this talk is not really the robot journalism part, the first bit of the title, but in fact the beyond the hype part of it. So um, the people at this table work in a bunch of uh, territories in developing countries. Uh, so we have people working in Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, India, um, and so on, South Africa. Um, and what we're hoping to share today, I think, is first of all, we will do a bit of the hype and show you the cool stuff that we've built. But actually what we hope the conversation will be about is about how do you justify in territories where, you know, you can either say that Africa has leapfrogged desktop or you can say we're lagging digitally. It depends how you want to think about it, as positively or negatively. Um, we want to try and tease out some questions about and some answers about how do you justify using high-tech solutions for journalism in territories where journalists don't actually have cars to get to stories, for example, to put it crudely. Um, so we're going to begin by, uh, by using about half an hour for the guys at the table to talk about and to show you the projects that they are working on. And then we're going to uh, do the second half of the, of the uh, talk, which will be around asking them hard questions about why the hell did you do it, whose money did you waste, and that kind of stuff. Um, so on my left, I have Nasser Ulhadi. Um, and I'm not actually going to define them by their organizations. I'm just going to tell you their names, and then they're going to tell you about their organizations, because I think the key to what we do here is that it's collaborative. And a lot of the kind of technology platforms that we use and technology solutions that we build to uh, a journalism in developing countries are ones that are all reusable and that are shared. And in fact, many of the uh, editorial resources could be shared as well. So it's Nasul Hadi, Soila Kenya, Lakapo Taviani from Nigeria, oddly enough, <laughs> and Justin Aronstein. So I'm going to ask Justin to start us off um, and talk a bit about his projects. Again, I'm trying to get them to limit themselves to a couple of slides and to five minutes so we can have a proper chance to interrogate them and to you know, question whether they are beyond the hype or they're just another version of the hype. Justin. Hi, guys. So um, my name is Justin. I'm a South African, but I work across the continent um, through a network of uh, news technology labs. And um, we actually do use robotics for, for um, uh, reporting projects. So um, the two projects that I'm going to be speaking about are um, just a demonstration of the wide variety of robotics that can be used in reporting in the field at scale um, and producing um, enough uh, work efficiently that it becomes part of the main kind of work stream of our news partners. So these aren't one-off special projects. Um, the first project is um, we support and we've invested into a network of uh, journalism drone pilots across the continent called African Drone. Uh, they've been running for about 10 months. They're already at break even, which means that they're, uh, we used um, donor money to help them set up as seed funding. But they're a f almost like a freelance photographic association but of drone pilots who are specially trained and who are equipped. Um, they're in 17 of the 54 countries in Africa at the moment, um, and they work with video mapping and a variety of other techniques that I'll speak about in a few minutes. The second project is um, kind of not in the air, not on land, is um, underwater. And we are off the coast of Tanzania, and in fact most of East Africa, um, one of the major problems around um, artisanal or sustainable fishing is a massive growth in dynamite or blast fishing, where large uh, foreign syndicates um, hand out dynamite and other explosives to fishermen, and they dump it in the water, and you get that kind of explosion, um, killing thousands of fish. They float to the surface, you scoop it up. But in the process, they're killing the coral reefs and the fishery... Um, uh, shoals and ecosystem, and as a result, we're seeing a plummet in fish stocks. So in that project, which is called uh, Blast Tracker, uh, based out of Tanzania, we have um, built a series of underwater microphones, hydrophones, um, that triangulate and track where an explosion happens, and that then triggers a fixed-wing drone. So you'll see in the other one for the journalistic projects, a lot of the drones are these quadcopters but um, they don't go very far. 
and they're in the air for, if you're lucky, half an hour, 40 minutes. To get offshore, we're using fixed wing drones and they're able to um, fly dramatically longer. To then triangulate where the boat is and then follow that back as a investigative project. But the hydrophones also generate um, big data with trends so that over time you can suddenly start mapping where these explosions are, what the patterns are, and that leads to a series of data-driven investigations. Um, that's a fairly limited scope project. Um, a second phase of that project is looking at using underwater drones, which would then also try and track and film some of the, the impacts. These two projects, both of which use drones um, and uh, sensors, um, were pioneered by local teams in Africa, but have been sufficiently successful that large media partners, now global media partners, are starting to contract these African pioneers to um, use those same approaches in covering issues elsewhere in the world. So this um, video loop here is from the Guardian US, where they worked with a team of African drone reporters who traveled around the United States with support from one or two partners, including the International Center for Journalists, and they reported on poverty in the US, urban poverty, and how urban planning um, kind of creates poverty pockets. Using exactly the same techniques that we've been using to cover this issue in Africa, but also just showing um, the impacts of it. The story in The Guardian um, attracted some of their highest reader engagements um, for uh, the six months, uh, the six month period that it was published. Um, just illustrating how it's not gimmickry, it's um, these immersive kind of very visual storytelling techniques help put people in a situation that kind of um, creates deepened engagement with the story uh, content itself. So those are the two projects that hopefully we're going to tease out the hows and whys, the costs and also the learnings because obviously none of the stuff goes smoothly, it's all new technology and it's fairly buggy to start with. Thanks very much, Justin. And that was an admirable use of time in a couple of minutes. Uh, Nasser Al Hadi. Um, hi. Um, I work with a team of Knight Foundation fellows in India for the International Center for Journalists, ICFJ. And that means we spend a lot of time in newsrooms uh, helping them think through uh, should they be taking on such projects, why they should be taking them on, and where they can go from uh, after they've built these projects out. Uh, the disclaimer here is that I haven't been involved with the production of either of these two projects. The first one that, that I'll talk about is where I helped put together uh, a lot of the people who worked on the project for the editor who was driving this. Um, so this is from one of the biggest newsrooms in the country. Uh, they publish in multiple languages. Um, two years ago, uh, I think pollution in Delhi hasn't necessarily been a new problem, but a lot of foreign publishers, the New York Times, AP, uh, the Bureau in the, Bureau in the country, um, went deep into why it's happening, how it's happening, and generated a lot of buzz. Uh, and that's when they decided that they wanted to figure out if they could install sensors, better sensors than the, what the government already had, uh, to try and map out where pollution was uh, direst in the country and where it wasn't. Uh, and the basic thing they did was just install sensors um, about a dozen sensors initially, and then come up with a map. Eventually, they were able to bring on other partners that sponsored some of the sensors so that the network expanded and got where it is today. Uh, they integrated this back into their storytelling by uh, making it a permanent fixture on their city's coverage page. So if you go to their website, uh, you go for Delhi or Mumbai or Bangalore, apart from the local stories that you'll see for the city, you'll also see a uh, zoom zoomed-in version of... Uh, the sensor data map that you're already seeing. There's another organization uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is a small startup nonprofit. This is one of the biggest for-profit media organizations in the country that did their own project around the same time, and you'll see their approach was slightly different. Could we just move to the slide? This is also a sensor map. Right now you're seeing two or three of these, but if you dive deeper, uh, they've got a lot more data. It's much more detailed. Um, I'll talk more about how both organizations uh, built these networks separately and with different approaches. But the interesting thing they did uh, with this one was um, they partnered with Twitter in India to be able to create, uh, if you tweeted with the hashtag brief, and you see I've tested it up there, tweeting at Justin, um, and name an Indian city, you'll probably, one of the major cities hopefully, 
you'll get a tweet back with what the pollution is like there right now. And you can try it right now if you'd like. Um, those are the two projects that we'll talk about uh, further down in the panel. I'd also like to point out that one of the pilots in the African drone project that Justin mentioned uh, did a similar project in India too for Mumbai, right? He did one of those. Yeah, uh, inequality yeah, yeah exactly. Daily or Mumbai. Exactly, exactly. So we can end up sharing a lot of our insights work. It's connecting these dots across regions. Um, that's my stuff. Great. Soila Kenya. Um, I'd just like to start off by apologizing for Catherine Gisheru, who was the one who's supposed to be seated where I am right now. Um, she's an ICFJ Knight Fellow and uh, the Code for Kenya lead where I work as well, uh, but she couldn't be here, so I'll just represent her. And disclaimer as well, the projects I'll be mentioning are not done by me, but um, I've interacted with them and I can just give a brief overview of what they're about. Um, so the first one is uh, about sensors. It's called Sensors Africa. It's pretty um, similar to what Nasser has just mentioned. It's about mapping air quality in, in, in Africa. So some background is that Africa has the worst case of air pollution out of all the other regions, and this is why uh, such a project is very much needed. So it's been piloted in uh, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, and I think it's about to be rolled out to more countries. So what you're looking at there is a prototype. Um, as you can see, it's very simple. The idea is that citizens are supposed to be able to actually um, sort of put these things together themselves and sort of start tracking. And then the data is sent to one place where it can always be refreshed, always in real time. You get the data about the air pollution in all these different countries. Um, and uh, right now, um, maybe you can just go to the next slide. Um, sorry. Yeah, this one. So this is the map where it's it's uh, hosted on OpenStreetMap, and as you can see, the that little green dot is uh, on Nairobi. So we have some some sensors in Nairobi, and what you're seeing there is um, live data. That I just took a screenshot of the website, and um, it's lit it's tracking right now um, what they call particulate matter, which has um, sulfates, nitrates, ammonia, black carbon, and sort of these really toxic. Um, uh, substances that can cause diseases like lung cancer and, and um, cardiovascular you know, problems. Um, so the idea is that we need data on how bad the situation is because it doesn't currently exist in a robust enough form. And uh, so that uh, media organizations, civic society organizations can get this data so that they can do more research, more policy formulation, and you know, sort of uh, map out the problem as it exists. Um, then the next project I'll be talking about is actually an investigative story that was done by a media publication called African Defense Review. And uh, the background of this is that uh, last year in January, there was an um, uh, Al-Shabaab attack. Al-Shabaab are a terrorist uh, group that exists in Somalia. So Kenya has a military in Somalia, and they have a base in a very small, out-of-the-way a town called Kulbio, and there was a, an attack by Al-Shabaab on that base. And so after the attack happened, um, the Kenya media had one story. They were saying that it was a very small attack, only uh, nine soldiers were killed and uh, 15 were injured. But then the Al-Shabaab came out and said the number was way higher than that, it was about 50 casualties and you know they did real damage to the base. So there was these two narratives that were ongoing and the, the question was who was right? So what these uh, guys did, African Defense Review, um, they um, did a story using satellite imagery to actually look at the uh, images before the attack and immediately after the attack so that they, ca they could see exactly what was happening on the ground and it was very, a detailed work where they were looking at, um, you know, where lorries were packed, where um, the base was, and literally just trying to identify how much damage had been done. And at the end of it all, they established that the Al-Shabaab story was actually the correct one, that, you know, the attack was really more, it was way worse than what the Kenyan government was saying, and eventually the, uh, the, the 
Kenya Defense Forces had to retract their claim and, and you know, sort of admit um, that, you know, the attack was that bad. So that wouldn't have been possible without satellite imagery and the work done by uh, Rich Richard Stupert, who's the features editor at African uh, Defense uh, Review. And uh, yeah, th that's the second project. Uh, Jacopo. Hi all, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Jacopo, I'm helping to create a transnational data team at Code for Africa, which basically involves designers, developers, journalists and researchers from uh, mainly four countries in Africa, but we're also creating a network that goes beyond Africa and I'm building a bridge between Europe and Africa and helping building transnational projects, transcontinental projects. I'm going to flag two projects during this speech. Uh, the first one is a project that our teams helped build. It is called uh, um, Kruger's Contested Borderlands. It's actually um, a long form multimedia investigation about Kruger Park, the national park that is, is mainly in South Africa and Mozambique. And we used geographic technology such as satellite images and uh, drone videos to um, show how communities were removed and displaced because of land grabbing. Um, there are some billionaires who are kind of acquiring land in, uh, in these areas, in these remote regions, to um, build game reserves, but it would be very difficult to go there physically, so we use satellite images to chart these uncharted territories. Um, I'm going to talk about that project later and show a couple of uh, screenshots and share the link with you so you can read the full story, which has been published uh, quite recently. Um, the, uh, it would be, as I said, it would be very difficult to uh, go there if not using these kind of uh, new tools that we, we can uh, easily access nowadays. Uh, the project was made in partnership with Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, Code for Africa, ICFJ, but also Oxpackers, which is an em environmental investigative journalism agency based in South Africa. And we also involved um, a Mozambican investigative journalist who knows the region quite well. Um, uh, and we also partner up with, uh, with a satellite uh, analysis company, a no-profit actually, called Radiant Earth, based in DC who provided satellite analysis um, of our of, of the pictures that we needed. So I'll show you a couple of, of uh, previews later. Mm. The other project I want to talk about, it is a project that I reported on uh, as an EJC grantee two years ago. It's called Rainforest Connections. It is uh, a, a no-profit started by a San Francisco-based phys um, researcher in physics, and it uses uh, old cell phones as sen it transforms old, old smartphones into sensors that try to collect noise of chainsaws in rainforests in order to monitor um, deforestation or illegal poaching. And uh, it is an incredibly inspiring project that has been uh, used not just in uh, Southeast Asia or Brazil, but also in the Congo Basin. Uh, so again, it's very interesting to see how these cheap technologies can be replicated and scaled up in order to monitor large portions of forests in order to counter illegal deforestations. So in 2016, uh, we went to like, my team, it was uh, myself and a filmmaker, Isako Kiev, went to Borneo and spent a couple of days with these guys at Rainforest Connections to see how they install these smartphones on the trees of the rainforest in Borneo. They set up um, a pilot sensor uh, in the middle of the forest and showed us how they can collect using artificial intelligence they can not just collect the the sound of the forest and the noise of kind of chainsaws and, and, and other, I don't know, guns or motorbikes, but they use artificial intelligence to uh, detect irregular uh, sound waves so that once there is, um, I don't know, um, an unexpected noise in the forest, they send an SMS to the authorities or to the activists who work in the region 
in order to intervene and stop the f deforestation. Um, I think these projects are very inspiring and uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss them with you later. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I've managed to restrict them, despite the uh, love of their pet projects, to uh, a very short time so we can ask some questions. Because I think the interesting thing is going to be how do we uh, understand getting beyond the hype? How do we understand how, do, how these kinds of technology, journalism, mashups are implemented in developing countries and in newsrooms? So I've prepared a list of questions that I want to ask them, kind of rubrics. Um, but I do invite you. Um, you don't need to wait until the end of this uh, for the usual 10 minutes of question time. But if you have any questions during, um, during the, the next few uh, minutes, please feel free to put up your hand and they can answer it, and in fact have to answer it. Um, so, but I'll kick off. Um, I think possibly the biggest question about this, and I'm gonna quote uh, the president of the ICFJ, who always says to us, where is the story? when we uh, parade our beautiful techno tools. <laughs> um, the question is, how do you turn these kinds of uh, data-driven uh, technology amplified, um, so this kind of subject matter, into a story? Like, how do you make it work for readers? Because clearly, uh, the, you know, the, audience we, the audience we're talking to now is an audience of um, high-end journalists who would embrace any kind of new way of telling the story. But how do you justify telling that story in the way you do as opposed to telling it in, in a kind of conventional and much, much cheaper form? And I mean, perhaps, Justin, you want to kick off with that? So I think, I mean, I think some of the people have already hit on the, 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 the kind of most obvious reasons that um, in any country or any region, not just Africa, Often this breaking news is happening out of reach. It's happening in isolated areas or it's happening in difficult to, to access um, locations. And things like drones, satellites, they, they give us immediate ways of getting there fast. Um, with the satellites, for example, we often use them in conjunction with drones. So with satellites, you can go back in time as well. Even if you weren't actively monitoring something, there's invariably footage of that place, sometimes going back even 10 kind of and longer years. And you can have a look and see how landscapes have changed, how rivers have swollen, uh, lakes have kind of shrunk, how forests have, have been chopped down, and then sending the drones for an up-to-date, um, detailed look, almost an immersive look that pulls people into the story. Previously, that was only possible by the CNNs and these guys of the world with helicopters um, and very expensive, um, uh, large equipment. They took a lot of planning and a lot of licensing. The small drones that we've been using, the small quadcopters, they literally, the latest ones, fold up into a package that's almost this size, um, but are producing broadcast quality um, content. The camera is obviously se separate from the drone. And at a price point, it's actually not that big. So smaller newsrooms, freelancers can afford this. What, where's the journalism in that? It means that suddenly you can put hard-hitting visual evidence to a story that previously would only have been two or three paragraphs um, and probably would have been dismissed and wouldn't be featured at the top of a page of a newspaper or broadcast. But that visual evidence compels people to pay more attention to the story. For example, if you compare what's happening in Syria at the moment with what's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the fact that um, although there are bigger like, uh, movements of people, uh, reports of larger numbers of civilian deaths out of the Congo, it's receiving far less attention simply because there's no visual evidence of this happening. So just having that material um, dramatically changes the, the paradigm. Um, the technologies are incredibly or increasingly cheaper. So the underwater hydrophone project that we're doing was inspired actually by Jacopo's earlier report about the Indonesian forest story. And what they were doing there was literally just taking old cell phones, mobile phones, putting them up in a tree and keeping them with a solar panel and keeping them on and just listening for the sound of a chainsaw, triangulating it and sending out an SMS to say, here's a warning. And we said, awesome, can we do this underwater? It's obviously never that easy. So it took us like 10 months to find uh, a way of doing that that is cost effective. But this, it's exactly the same principle. It sends out an immediate alert. 
which means suddenly a reporting team can be on the beach when the boat with the illegal fish or the, the dynamited fish arrives back. You're on the scene, you're giving breaking news reportage. It's no longer just based on a press release from a conservation NGO. You actually have kind of caught people red-handed. And in addition to that, this long-form data over a very extended period allows you to do some real analysis. So it's not just hit-and-run reporting. You can start understanding which communities have been subverted and are involved, what the problem is, and suddenly the science reporters are now starting to get in, be involved in investigative reporting as well. So those are just the two examples that I've, I've seen. Um, the air quality projects have also allowed um, some of the media partners in Nigeria to deepen their audience engagement. So you're telling stories about the air quality, and they're writing one story for the whole of Lagos City, which is massive, multi-millions of people. People read that story, and suddenly it's more immediate because they can go onto the website or the app, and they can see what the air quality reading is for their immediate street or neighborhood. So suddenly that story is more engaged or more important to them as an individual and more meaningful. And they claim that they've seen higher numbers of people coming back again to the page. So suddenly the journalism is more useful. It's information that you can use, which I think is the other aspect. Uh, so that's hardcore, right? Uh, I'll give you two examples that are softer and then maybe go back to some of the hardcore stuff. So uh, softer journalism stories that might not have been possible without the use of technology and not necessarily intimidating, slightly intimidating um, devices like sensors and drones, etc. cetera. Uh, but a small piece of software that's much more, relatively more affordable. Um, uh, there were two Bollywood actors that got into a fight at a restaurant. Um, and joke. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a true story, right? So um, over dinner, um, and I think the newsroom heard about it late at night. They weren't sure who was witness to it, whether it was a rumor, did it actually happen? And there's this very interesting dashboard called Data Miner that we've used in some of our partner newsrooms. And when we heard about it, the next morning, when the morning shift came in, they were not sure what to carry about it, right? What was trustworthy, what wasn't. Both their PR people weren't speaking to the uh, press and so on. And what we were able to do, because this software tracks tweets from various locations, uh, we were able to figure out what were the tweets coming out of that particular restaurant neighborhood uh, the previous night around 8 p.m. And based on who was tweeting from that location, nobody tweeted about the incident, they were able to figure out who was actually there, send them a direct message, hear back from them, call them on the phone and ask them if they'd actually seen it. And incidentally, they actually had taken photos, which the newsroom was able to get. All of this happens within 30 minutes of the start of the morning shift. They figure out that an incident has happened. They don't have otherwise any direct human access to it. They use a piece of software to figure out who was actually there, reach out to them, hear back, get actual visual evidence that it happened, and so on. Um, the second story is um, there was a dust storm in the Middle East that was starting to have an impact on Western India. And uh, it, this was a slower day, slower afternoon in the newsroom. Um, and we didn't have any big stories to run with at that point in time, and we decided, okay, this is a fancy piece of software, let's mess with it. Um, and so we hovered over the western part of the country, Rajasthan, to look for, you know, what was happening about the dust storm. Were people tweeting about it? Were they, were, were they talking about it? And so on. And we saw there was a particular concentration of tweets in one part of that state. And when we zoomed in on it, we were able to figure out that there was a race of auto rickshaws. I don't know if you know what those are. There's scooters basically driving rickshaws. Um, and was with all kinds of fancy, colorful um, decoration on these vehicles. And there was a rally of auto rickshaws happening in the middle of the desert with international participants that had gotten disrupted. And this was nothing anybody knew about. Um, and somebody put this together, all the visual photos and everything from that story together using that technology. Um, it was the most successful piece of that evening because overall across the city it was a slower news day. But coming back to some of the hardcore stuff, this pollution project that I talked about earlier, it was primarily in response to um, a policy by the Delhi government because of the whole pollution scare, where they decided that they would allow cars with even license plate numbers to operate on even days in a week. So I think all, Tuesdays and Thursdays would be all la cars with even license plate numbers. And the Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays would essentially be all the cars, uh, with, cars with uh odd license plate numbers. And we Indians, we like our small cars like the Italians too, but that's pr not so much because we live in 
beautiful medieval towns with narrow roads, but because we are very densely populated cities, there's way too many of us. Um, and the theory of the government was, this was what was calling pollution in, in one of the largest cities in the world. Um, the two projects in response, they, it took them time, of course. It wasn't like we weren't able to get there immediately, no satellite uh, photos, et cetera. But once your sensor networks were in place, they were able to audit that government policy for was your assumption right? Was it actually because of the vehicles that were uh, crowding the roads in the city? Um, and once the sensor network went up, they realized it was actually because slightly up north, farmers were burning uh, crops uh, after the harvest season, essentially. And that was leading to a cloud of smoke that was then winds were bringing over Delhi and that was what was causing everyone to be buying pollution masks and so on. But so the technology helped prove that the story was actually something else and the government policy was still not be effective. Um, so, Although we will welcome questions if anybody wants to ask one during the course um, of the talk. Anybody want to ask any questions? Oh, there's one in the back. Just before you start, I'm going to be asking a question about does technology make us stupider? Because I've just realized there's a typo in my uh, sentence about are there readers, <laughs> which I deliberately did, I promise you, to check whether we were uh, stupid <laughs> or not. But I'll ask that question later. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Hi, uh, Sue Valentine. I'm from the uh, Independent Journalism Program at the Open Society Foundations. I think, Justin, to your point, maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the challenges to actually getting journalism to come out of... Uh, some of the countries, specifically in Africa, because I'd maybe argue a little that I don't think it's only because they're not images coming out of DRC. I think that there are other uh, contextual issues. And so what are the, is this something that you are thinking about, how to get stories from the data to journalism, or is that kind of somebody else's part of the problem? I think, so, so we've been doing this for about seven years, Sue, and um, I think in the in initially, everyone was excited by the shiny technology. So initially, we made the mistake of um, going a kind of a pure tech route with the assumption that if you give the newsroom the kind of the raw data, the raw imagery, that wonderful journalism would kind of would evolve. But the reality is that just like any other press release or any other package, you're just dropping it in and no one feels invested into it or don't understand the context. So what we've learned to do over the years is that any of these projects now are actually steered by editorial teams with the tech guys and the gadget guys either in support of them or it's actually journalists who've reinvented themselves to kind of be able to use some of the stuff. And as a result, it's also, it shapes everything from what kind of data you're monitoring for, what kind of materials you're collecting. So we are starting to get some really good journalistic product out of that. The problem is that um, some of the storytelling, because they've gone to great lengths and used great innovation to create it, still is incredibly self-indulgent. So they go for very long form, they go for very complex designed kind of packages. And the reality is that that doesn't really work well on the websites or on the TV shows. So you're still not getting the kind of audience numbers that make it uh, kind of uh, sustainable. Um, that's now changing in a quick way. Um, and the, the reason for that is that no, these are no longer being treated as special projects. The moment it's treated as a special project, you lavish too much attention on it. And ironically, they then tend to suffer. So it's now part of the mainstream production. Um, you're, you're South African, although I don't think you're based there anymore, but there's an investigative television show called Carte Blanche, which uh, does uh, weekly investigative reporting. They're now producing um, every two weeks a drone-driven investigation story. So it's become easy enough that it's now routine, and I think that's the secret, is trying to make it routine. That doesn't answer the, the Congo um, issue, and you're right, there are a lot of other contextual problems there. But one of them is access. So being able to get feet on the ground into the eastern Congo as, or into uh, western Uganda to actually measure the extent of those kind of um, uh, refugee um, uh, crises is a big part of the problem that we've just been asked to help with, and, and the African drone team specifically, 
um, have deployed two different teams. And they've also given them access to satellites. So I think that it's a small piece. It's not the only piece because you still need strong media partners. You need kind of competent storytellers to weave this all together so that it's not all just gadgets. I think the trick here is getting the price point down and demystifying the technology so that you don't really need an engineer to use it. And the drones these days have, uh, because of automation and machine intelligence, they just, I can fly one and I'm not particularly well coordinated. So it's becoming easier to use as well. The big challenge at the moment is not cost or complexity of technology, it's the growing regulation around the use of these things. So um, the reason why we think we've had better take up in Africa of specifically drones, camera drones, is because it was a legal vacuum. There were no laws against it. And we're now starting to see countries putting them in place. Fairly, and they're not, they're not all bad laws either. So South Africa, Kenya have actually got fairly logical kind of regimes in place. Um, and that's driving up the cost a bit because you've got to get licensed. So, um, but at the same time, it's professionalizing it in a big way as well. Yeah, I think if there was a popularity contest uh, for technology and journalism, drones always win for some odd reason. Um, but I think a good segue there would be to, uh, leading on from Sue's question, would be to ask uh, Soela and Jacopo, and obviously you can feel free to kick us to somebody else if you're not interested. Um, what actually constitutes a good story that's based on sensor data. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking you what constitutes an award-winning story, because that's fairly irrelevant. What constitutes a good story for a newsroom? What, how, do, how would they measure it as a success? Uh, either of you. And maybe also you can tell us about um, how do you, specifically with your project, how do you build those sensors? I mean, is it a, a massive cost involved? How do you get the journalists and the editorial team to understand what they do and, and what they are? So I think I'll start with the second question about how we get um, this data to the journalism, uh, to the journalists and the newsrooms. Um, so basically, where uh, the sensors um, data, sort of the the software, the hardware is out based out of our office in Nairobi, and so all of us interact with it, not only the team that's working on it. And we're always joking that, you know, it's a lot of wires and all that, and we're always joking that they're not, they better not like blow us up or something, because, you know, it looks very techy and all that, and we're journalists and we're like, what's going on? But um, so making this um, normal for people is one of the first things. And so one of uh, our other projects called Wana Data um, which is a network of uh, female journalists who are writing data stories. Um, they come for regular meetings, and so what we try and do is have uh, the software developer who's working on that project, his name is James Chege. We have him give them like sort of 15 minute presentations on what he's doing right now, how much uh, data has been gathered, where the sensors are located in the city, and things like that, because they all work with their own uh, newsrooms. And so sort of just uh, baiting them and like, you know, giving them that taste of what's going on right now. And uh, so you find that they actually are interested in writing such stories and not just the daily news cycle. So um, most of them are, you know, health reporters and, and science uh, reporters, and this is a health issue, it's a science issue. And they're always asking up, uh, after this uh, uh, data. And um, so air quality is something you can't see and uh, people don't really think about it that much. So this is definitely a good uh, story for newsrooms, um, but it's just providing them the data because the data needs to exist in the first place. So I think once you provide the data, once you um, bring in these journalists, like we show them the sensors where like this is how it is, this is how it works, this is how it runs um, and all this and let them interact with this tech because if you make it sort of a distant thing, like, you know, it's just for the tech guys, then that's when you have that disconnect and that's when you have people who, the journalists who don't really care or don't connect with uh, these um, projects. But once you bring them in, I think you'd find that they're actually interested in doing uh, these stories. So I just, just wanted to add one thing. So, I mean, I agree completely that familiarity um, kind of demystifies it. The other thing that we found is a big incentive is 
we don't try and use any of these technologies to do things that can be done anyway, because otherwise you're overcomplicating a reporting story. So you should only be using a sensor or a drone or, or, or kind of any of the other robotics um, to do something that would others, otherwise be impossible for the journalist to do. And the moment that, that's, that the newsroom understands that, it stops being a luxury kind of um, gadget. It starts becoming something that gives them an edge. And we found that the tone of the stories change as well. It's no longer um, kind of look how clever we are and look how beautiful our 360 video is. It's about um, we can only tell this story in this way. There's no other way to tell it. So whether it's kind of using data to map the invisible kind of air pollution or actually being able to get into a disaster zone quickly, I think it's those utility-focused um, challenges that we should be only using these technologies for. Otherwise, to some extent, they just they become they become frivolous. Did you want to do? Well, very quickly, though, um, uh, slightly different, same similar point about how do you choose what projects to go after for this. Um, but the newsrooms that I have I have experience with find it uh, difficult to justify use of any of this kind of tech because it's not just the tech; it's also the logistics of installing it and getting it used, and do we have the right people for it, right? using it for even a one-off enterprise story, no matter how important it is, or even a series. Uh, they'd rather do this for something that is a recurring story every year, even if it deals smaller reports, but they are consistent. So think of this like the way you think of recurring subscriptions to uh, um, software. And so for them, it's usually a one-time investment, but it makes us relevant to the conversation every time this issue comes back and is big. And they'd rather do it for something that's uh, recurring that way. The second thing is um, the two projects that I refer to, they were about the same topic, but they were uh, by organizations at very different scales. The one by the smaller organization was actually much more successful. And the reason was the partnership that they did, they realized they were not just building journalism, but trying to build their journalism about air quality around a small utility that they were providing to citizens. So the citizens didn't come back for the journalism. This was a lesser known brand. They came back for this utility that they had built that had far wider reach, and they were tweeting to their handle all the time with their hashtag, et cetera. It made the small brand much more visible, but every time they'd land back on the dashboard, the air quality stories from the publisher would be all around it. And uh, so they kind of used it as a, I don't want to use clickbait, but bait. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, oh, great, yes. Hi, Mira Salva from. Can you hear me? Yep. Mira yeah. Salva from the Reuters Institute. Could you talk a little bit about the business models of these stories? Have they um, brought in new streams of revenue for you? Have they brought you new audiences? You know, how how's that worked? Yeah, that's a really terrible question. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure this guy's very happy to pretend to know the answer. <laughs> So um, the drone network has actually been set up as a, as a um, uh, self-help association of freelancers. And the, any of the stories I've referred to, including actually one with Reuters, they did one called Slumscapes, where they had a look at um, shanty towns in Mexico, uh, across Africa, and in India. Um, all of those have been paid for assignments by media partners. So um, that specific project has been running for 10 months, and they're at break-even. They're actually no longer using their donor money. They're now making enough uh, paid kind of assignment work that they're covering their costs and they're generating enough money to renew equipment and so forth. Um, whether that will continue, we're not certain, because um, they need to, they're sustaining interest and kind of commissions at the moment by newsrooms who are testing out the opportunities. The, the threat is, or the kind of one of the concerns is that once the newsrooms say this works, they'll go out and they'll buy their own drones. So, but definitely um, it proves the, the cost efficiency of using these things. The newsrooms are using their normal freelance budgets, so it's not kind of massive amounts of additional money. The Blast Fishing Project was set up as a, um, a non-profit uh, data journalism project, a standalone run um, by a partnership between an uh, uh, um, environmental journalism NGO and um, a marine scientist. So that one probably, in my estimation, will probably never really make money unless they kind of um, partner with a large media syndicate. But even then, I, I think it's going to be a specialist kind of loss, uh, a loss leader. 
Um, but a number of the other projects, the air sensor projects, for example, we're seeing heightened new audiences, and then we're seeing the media partners starting to sell um, additional advertising, premium subscriptions around it. In Nigeria, at least, they're getting people to register for SMS updates, but it's a premium SMS. So they're generating small, but um, growing kind of additional revenue on it. Again, I don't think it'll ever replace advertising, but it's supplementary. And we try and encourage our projects to think about those opportunities um, to at least remove some of the, the kind of the setup costs from, from getting them running. Um, I think it's early days, but uh, Reuters itself, I think, is looking at um, increased use of drones on some of its larger set-piece projects. The Sunscapes one was, I think, called by Place, uh, a Reuters kind of program, yeah. Um, there's an, another, another um, answer as well. So, there, I mean, there are two kinds of revenue. There's actual revenue and the hope of revenue. And the hope of revenue is sometimes what you sell a data project on because uh, you can't guarantee that it will end up in revenue. But um, a big project we're about to embark on, which I can't actually talk a lot about because it uh, hasn't started as yet, is based on a model which we've shown in, uh, as a proof of concept in smaller projects, which is that you um, use a data set that's either an old one or one that's not um, entirely complete to produce a journalism or a data tool which allows users to feed back into that data loop and to thereby clean up the data and to add new data to, to the uh, to the project. An example of something we've done is, for example, we've uh, built a tool sharing, um, allowing you to, to determine whether your traditional surgeon that you would use for initiation um, is registered or not. And the data set was a very small government data set. Um, but what happened is that the tool also allowed you, if you were unregistered, to become legal. So it built up the data set and cleaned it up and made it more valuable. So our next, our next um, uh, kind of strategy is to, on the big data projects we're working on, to clean that up and to build a kind of data store which is then sellable by the news organizations. And I guess it's a bit like the, uh, is it uh, ProPublica uh, data store kind of a model? Um, because obviously a lot of the data in the areas we work in is incomplete or dirty or um, you know, made up. Um, so that kind of model, I think, also is, is appealing to editors and business owners of media organizations. That, in fact, the story creates a uh, commodity that you can sell. Can I quickly add something on that? Um, so seeing this from a journalist's perspective is also interesting, I think. So what can I do as a journalist to use these technologies if I don't have funds? So what I, the myth I want to kind of bust here is that some of these technologies are not expensive at all. I'm talking about, for example, uh, uh, some of the interactive uh, visualizations that we made for the Kruger story can be made for free without using any kind of coding skills. Uh, for example, we used a tool called Juxtapose.js by the Night Lab, and it's freely available online, and that would allow anyone to show before and after uh, for example, with an, inter an interactive slide, you just need to input the two images on the tool and then you can embed your interactive for free on your story. So that's super cheap. Same thing, nowadays getting a satellite image can be quite cheap, especially if you rely on services uh, by Google Earth, for example, or Radiant Earth. Um, anyone can get free or almost free f uh, of charge satellite images why it would be very difficult to do that five years ago. Um, so I think, I mean, I, want, I would recommend also freelancers or like curious journalists who want to experiment with these tools to get their hands dirty and start doing that without like thinking about uh, rocket science. I mean, it's, it's quite easy to get satellite images. It's quite easy to make data visualizations or data um, interactive timelines or itineraries, maps. You name it. Uh, it's, there are so many tools out there, and I'm happy to share more tools later if you want to know more. And, and, yeah. so is, and um, if we switch back to the uh, laptop screen, I can show a, a version of what Jacopo is talking about. And so in the, in just, the meantime, yeah, just as, you, as you load it. Oh, you want to say something? Well, I was, I was just going to say that um, what Jacopo says is 100% correct, that the tools and the, the um, imagery is becoming cheaper. But I think that what we need to be really super honest about and that newsrooms need to understand is that 
while the raw materials are cheaper, it takes time, and time is money. So you, you're kind of tying up the time of senior journalists, designers, production people, building a set of packages. And this is where this thing I keep on going on about indulgent reporting, we need to start thinking beyond just the one-offs. So for this stuff to be super useful and have real kind of transformative impacts in newsrooms, we need to be clever about speaking these, about thinking about these long-tail projects that are either recurring or that actually create a new audience um, or, or a new service, uh, uh, information service for, for a media partner. Because it takes timing, it takes planning, and then you need to pull in readers to actually make it worth your while, and that, that takes extra resources. And often, because these projects are usually pl um, planned by journalists, they put no thought into any of that stuff. So they build beautiful storytelling, they put it out there, and they wait for lightning to strike, and it often doesn't. So I think that it's, that's kind of one of the things that we're pushing with a lot of our partners at the, at the moment is that we refuse to even um, uh, help you start a project unless we've got some of these people at the table to help us plan the audience engagement campaign and make us understand what the time commitment's going to be so that people don't get halfway through and become disillusioned. Um, uh, just to add to that, um, going back to the business model question and the idea of hope of revenue, um, the first project that I talked about by the bigger newsroom, it was totally sold on the idea of hope of revenue. Um, and there's been a lot of sessions here that have talked about not thinking about audiences, not even users or subscribers, but thinking about members, people who feel part of or part ownership of your journalism project and so on. And what this did was by picking the right issue, A, they were not pioneers. These were the first censor projects in media that were fairly known. There had been a ton of citizen initiatives that were already doing in microgrids of sensors all over the country anyway. All of those microgrids suddenly said, we want to be part of the larger network. So it tapped into an entire community that was not part of the, that was not necessarily an audience for either of these journalism brands, one. Um, the second point, which they didn't tap into as much because leadership changed the traction around the idea kind of uh, waned a bit, uh, was uh, the thought around journalism not just as a service, but as an experience, and going back to members, right, where you're not just reading our content, but you feel you're participating in both the production process and everything else that happens around it. And the thought was, could then, after publishing these stories every year, could they do annual community events around these, maybe in schools, getting people or students to start building sensors of their own, doing those exercises, finding the right sponsors for some of those events. So there's a ton of potential revenue points that you can build around projects like this if they can yield recurring stories and if you can if it's not just the journalists approaching the problem, but the product managers and the marketing managers working in sync with the journalists to figure out, okay, there's a meaningful story here, but there's also a meaningful campaign that we can do. And we can involve the audience, not just as readers, but across all the touch points that we create uh, for this project. The disclaimer again being, not all of this got translated into action because of a range of circumstances, but the idea is still there. Anybody else want to ask any questions? There we go, the bearded fellow. The rest of us. <laughs> sorry, the guy in the check shirt, I meant to say, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Um, hi. Yes, I'm going stand up. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see if I could get you to elaborate on that, that last point you made about engaging communities in the process, because a lot of the technological forms that you've spoken about so far today are quite, although relatively cheap, high end and for journalistic purposes, which requires a skill set, various points of literacy, um, and you know anything that you could reflect on on the type of projects that you do to engage ordinary citizens would be, yeah, great. I'm Lawrence, by the way. Thank you. Hey, Lawrence, I'll take a first stab at us. I'm sure some of the others have got um, uh, a kind of input as well. So the, the air sensor project is busy being rolled out in Tanzania at the moment. And um, the news partner simply doesn't have the capacity to maintain a network of two or 300 air sensors across a city or across a region. So what they've done is they've partnered up with the local equivalent of a Girl Scout movement. Um, so it's a Girl Science movement at uh, schools. And they've helped develop a small curriculum around um, weather science. So each of these sensors mon monitor the air, temperature, rainfall, and they've created, they've built little kits that they're now giving to the schools, and the school science teacher is the custodian, and there's a small science uh, group that, uh, that 
gets the data at the same time the newsroom does, and they use it for class exercises. It serves two purposes. Suddenly you've got a custodian who ensures that no one's stealing the equipment, who looks after the solar panel and the rest of it. But you've suddenly got an interest group where these kids now go home and tell their parents about it, and suddenly there's increased kind of deeper use of the tools around it, not necessarily the journalism. The media partner believes that once they activate their news portal that aggregates all these single data points, that that kind of community of users that they've built around it will become almost their ambassadors and champions and drive sustained usage. That's the idea. Um, whether it will work or not, we'll see. But I think the important point is here that they'd solved their biggest problem, which was we can buy the sensors, they're cheap, but then we're going to have to employ someone to drive around and kind of check these things the whole time. So that's one approach that I'm, I'm pretty excited about to see how it goes. There's a project that we're supporting in South Africa where you get annual cholera. Every time it rains, there's cholera in the rivers, and some rural communities still drink a lot of water out of the rivers. And they're, they're using or they're testing sensors that photograph the water, blow it up, have a piece of software that analyzes whether there are coliforms, the things that cause, cause cholera in there, and then send out an SMS alert. And they're using the same strategy. They've gone for local science clubs. Um, they're struggling with the technology, but the point is that they're finding ways of amplifying their reach. But it's to solve a problem. It's not because they're being fancy and they want audience engagement. I think the side effect of that is going to be that they've built a, a, a kind of an engaged user group around the project. So, and what, I, we call, what we're excited about is like the Indian project. Basically, you know, the champions and the people who are passionate about it move on, and then the projects tend to fizzle out. This is almost a fallback strategy also that if the media loses interest, potentially there's still communities or other people that can continue using the information and the hardware. Yeah. Um, the way the smaller organizations solved it was, uh, if, for any of you who have actually uh, explored air quality projects, the egg, that's yeah. the popular sensor, they realized that was going to be too costly for them. They're a small nonprofit, and so they actually spent the time finding the right local technologist who was invested enough in the issue to assemble them themselves, and they did a good enough job that that's now a business unit for a news organization. They send, sell their cheaper air quality sensing kits to other corporates or other customers across the country that are, or even academic institutions that are interested in setting up their own projects for non-journalistic purposes too. And the, that revenue is what funds that, uh, the maintenance of that entire sensor network. The question, does that revenue actually cover the cost of employing that person and buying the hardware there? Uh, more people than the core person. Because oh, okay. often, I mean, often that's a bit of smoke and mirrors where people say, ah, oh, it's generating revenue, but actually it's ne not co covering the cost of actually generating the revenue. <laughs> Um, we, we only have uh, less than 10 minutes left. Um, I mean, I would have liked to have answered the question. In fact, I'm going to answer that question as well, just quickly. Um, for me, the, the best example of um, how um, a data slash technology project becomes something that's valuable to the news, the, the news organization um, is one that was uh, built by some colleagues of ours called Open Up, uh, Code for South Africa at the time, which was um, a tool which allowed you to check whether you were paying your domestic worker a living wage. Um, and they based the, the data about what a uh, living wage was um, partly on government census data about what uh, domestic workers earned. Um, it turned out that that was old data and out of date, and that once they'd got the community to feed back in on kind of like a continuum of guilt and uh, because you weren't paying enough at all to um, kind of pride because I'm not, I am paying enough, they managed to build up a whole new uh, data set of what domestic workers in the different provinces of South Africa actually earned. And um, so that's valuable data in itself. But what actually happened then was that every other media organization uh, covered the story, um, but covered it um, by covered it as well as marketing the kind of parent organization for the data. You know, so the, the editors of the, of the news organization were pulled onto other news platforms to do interviews and that kind of stuff. I think that's another kind of a, a way to, to use this kind of technology projects is to make it something that's so special and so new that other media houses are forced to, uh, to, you know, to push your project. So we, unless there are any other questions, I've got one last question since we only have a few minutes left. Anybody else? So uh, the question I want to ask is, tell us about the bad projects, the ones that go wrong. How do we avoid that? 
What, what constitutes a bad project? Um, you know, because it's, it's all been about the successes, and as we all know, the best stories are the ones where you fail. I'm assuming there were some failures. There were failures. Um, Format-wise, I can think of extremely well-crafted long forms with fantastic interactive visualizations that cost a lot of money and time that are not consumed enough by the audience. So we need to be careful that we're not building projects that are extremely beautiful, but are not being accessed by the right people and by the right audiences. There are several ways to avoid that problem. One of them is, or at least to mitigate that problem, one of these uh, could be like a kind of cross-platform pra uh, practice and strategy, meaning that you are packaging the story in multiple formats for multiple audiences, perhaps translating it in uh, multiple languages, especially if you are talking to or accessing audiences that are not speaking English, for example, or like in rural areas, in that case you can use radio. This is something that uh, at least I faced, especially when I started doing this kind of interactive projects initially. You know, you, you have these tools and you feel like, you as a journalist, you feel like, okay, let's try and see how we can make it very beautiful and very sophisticated. And then you go on the analytics data from Google Analytics or for, from Chartbeat or you name it, your know, statistics, traffic, volumes, and how many people are accessing your story and you see that the average time on the page is very low, like one minute, two minutes, or three minutes. Uh, that's a failure in my opinion. We need to avoid that. Very quickly, another way to avoid that is to unpack your long form story into a series. And I know that uh, the Rogers Foundation uh, is doing that very often. We are marrying the same strategy. And instead of running a one-off long form uh, drone journalism piece, we unpack it in episodes and make a series of stories and then perhaps also publish the long form with some extra content and uh, some extra interactive visualizations. So that's something that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, we're doing a water, sense, uh, sorry, a water data project right now, which is supposed to be uh, the canary in the coal mine for a sensor project around water. And what that does is we're doing it with the largest Hindi newspaper, uh, local language newspaper in India, and uh, we've set up the data grid right now with easily available open data around some of the all the districts in the largest state of the country. And what we're doing is we're spending the next quarter testing out whether there's enough audience interest in this presentation of data in these locations to uh, justify our case that we actually need to go out and install sensors in all of these locations to be able to get much more accurate, much more detailed uh, data for all of this. So, the strategy essentially there is build a low-cost version of this pro project that is data-driven, but not sensor data-driven. Um, test out if there's an audience for it, and if there's demand, ask them as openly as you can, include them in the conversation, and if there is, and we haven't gotten there yet, uh, make the case to actually have sensors deployed and with the right you know, people covering the sponsors, covering the cost, and so on. So I think, um, I mean, I think probably about 50% of the projects that we pilot um, publish, but if you have to be take a hard, cold look at them, uh, it can't be considered to be grand successes. And the reason for that is some of the things that Jacopo mentioned, that people overinvest and so the audience sizes aren't big enough. But I think that for us, one of the, the mistakes that we've seen people make repeatedly is that people are just too enthusiastic. So the teams that are doing these projects jump in and plan them and execute them without thinking through kind of the opportunity costs or without planning for when things go wrong. So um, uh, in, in a fairly amusing one, we, we were using drones to um, film um, uh, fishermen, abalone poachers, who and were illegally kind of grabbing uh, fish stocks out of a, a nature reserve area. Um, uh, and um, one of the fishermen kind of noticed this happening and actually took a piece of uh, fishing line with a sinker on it, so a piece of lead, and managed to throw it in the air and hook the drone right out of the sky and pull it out of the sky. So the guy lost the drone. Um, then they held the drone captive so they could identify the pilot. And the, what went wrong there was there's no insurance for the drone, number one. Number two, the guy, the freelancer who was doing it was actually filming illegally because he hadn't been kind of licensed. And the, the news partner was completely unaware of that. It wasn't, he wasn't part of our network at the time. But then thirdly also, 
they literally, the gang that was doing this, were um, held the drone uh, captive to try and extract the names of the journalistic team working on the story because they wanted to intimidate the television team. There was no real planning in place for those contingencies. And what it taught the media partner here was that you've got to plan these things out in advance. Just because there's shiny gadgets involved doesn't mean that you should be taking professional risks. So I think that's the one thing that people often don't think about. And then the second thing is also just, the, even though the equipments and the technologies are cheap, you always have to ask the question about, is it worth the price? Could we not be doing three or four other solidly reported, more traditional stories that are also on important issues? Is it really worth spending the money on doing this new approach? If it's innovating a whole new work approach in a newsroom, then yes, because you're changing the DNA of the company. If it's purely a vanity project, because you want to do something to win an award or, or kind of make a name, um, you're actually squandering very, very kind of rare resources. Um, I think I'll just uh, touch on the issue that Jacopo brought up about, you know, audience engagement and how it can be really low. Um, one thing you can do is to build your audience even before you write these stories. So what we do in Nairobi, we have this um, monthly meetup called Hack Suckers. It's run all over the world. And what we do is try and build this community of tech, uh, uh, tech guys and, and journalists who then have this interest in the stuff we're doing and we're always teasing the stuff we're doing and telling them about it. And then you, you sort of have this network of people that slowly by slowly can run into the thousands. And so you already have this initial audience, this initial ambassadors for some of the projects that you're running. And um, they tend to be, if they're techies and journalists, then they tend to be in, in a network where their information can spread really quickly, and so you'd have, you know, mainstream media maybe um, tapping into some of these projects that you're doing, and maybe hosting them on their sites, and therefore, you know, getting more audience engagement. So, yeah, that's something you can possibly think about. Just having this community of people who are sort of just ready for any of the cool stuff you're doing, and so that you know your projects don't fall flat. Yeah. Uh, guys, thank you very much. We're out of time, um, especially Soila for stepping in at the last minute. Um, and thanks for being a great audience. I believe you say that at the end of these talks. And uh, thank you, Justin, for stealing the story I was going to tell as my, uh, to get my last laugh, but never mind. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to uh, chat to any of us afterwards about some collaborations, please, we are so open to that. Um, you can grab us on Twitter or grab us in the flesh. Thank you.